Welcome to Cornerstone's Walking in the World equipping class. I am Brian, and along with me I have Scott. Present. And Matt. Hi. And attendance has been taken. <laughs> what we're doing in this class is teaching you how to live the basic Christian life. The class is built around the discipleship pathway we have talked through earlier in the class. And this is our fifth session overall and our first session exploring the mission category, the category about loving and deep relationships with non-Christians. And here's what we'll talk about in this session. First, how mission is a part of spreading God's glory, the purpose of God in the world. Second, we're going to get an overview of what mission looks like. And then third, we're going to learn how we can pursue mission by knowing other people well. And so let's start off like this. A lot of people talk about relationships with non-Christians and use pretty much exclusively the word evangelism. Now, we're talking about mission. Why is that? Well, it's interesting. Evangelism is a, a good word, and we're not opposed to evangelism. But evangelism is maybe too narrow. It's one element of the mission of God. And when we're talking about mission, we're talking about something um, bigger, grander, and rooted in God's really purpose and plan for the universe. And, and the Bible really is this one um, story, and we've talked about this already, about God spreading and displaying his glory. And we are part of that story. And we can't understand really the the part that we play or really the plan and purpose of God um, without understanding the the main storyline of the Bible. And all of this helps us understand what mission is. And so uh, give me a minute. Um, but the four main acts of the Bible are creation that we see in Genesis 1 and 2, the fall that we see in Genesis 3, redemption that we see really the vast majority of the Bible from Genesis 3.16 all the way through to Revelation 20, and then the fourth act is the new creation, which happens in Revelation 21 and 22. And what we, um, our role that we play, we find ourselves in the third act, in the act of redemption, that God has this uh, massive, cosmic, glorious plan to redeem sinful people. And it's culminated in the incarnation, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he's created this new covenant that's spreading across the earth, across generations, uh, until this act is over and a new creation comes. And so we're in the middle of this story, um, and we've been reconciled to God ourselves, but he's also given us this message that we're going to play a central role in this big mission, this big plan of God to reconcile the world back to himself, and we're called to be part of that, entrusted with this message of reconciliation that we're called to share with others um, in our city and across the world, um, which is where the evangelism piece comes in. Um, but we don't just benefit from this cosmic plan of God. We actually participate in it. And so mission is this grander, broader, deeper, more cosmic picture of God's overarching plan that we are called to be a part of, and that's why we use the word mission um, instead of focusing on just the task of evangelizing. Yeah, I mean, and I think that it's so such a powerful component, right, of the ways that we are called, all the ways that we're called to spread and display God's glory, right? We, we're, we're called to spread and display his glory through the ways we walk with God personally, as we talked about, and through community, as we just finished talking about in the last four sessions. Um, but even... It, in this story that he's writing across all of history and across the world, like there's a part each one of us are called to play in our specific locations among those, not, not just among the Christians around us, but among those who don't know Christ yet. I mean, when, when I think about my neighborhood, right, there, there is, uh, in most of the houses uh, around in most of the apartments um, in my neighborhood, like there, there's not much of God's glory, right? But God has placed me there. He's placed me there. He's placed my family there to, to be a part of the spreading and displaying to the people in uh, my neighborhood um, in, 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 and in the other relationships that, that we have um, in our city and in our town as, as a part of this cosmic work really brought local. And so mission then is this cosmic plan of God to spread and display his glory by redeeming and reconciling the world back under his authority that he invites us to be a part of. And it's one of the ways then that we spread and display the glory of God. If you think about the other sections that we've covered so far in just community in this class and in the last class, you know, Bible, prayer, and heart work, at some level, the only way any of that exists for us listening to it is because of mission. 
So the only way that we were able to uh, know God, to spread and display his glory in our own lives and in our community is because mission happened and came to us. And so at mm-hmm. some level, we're tasked with continuing that on and also just appreciating how God's glory does not get spread and displayed without this. There are other ways to do it, but this is a very important one of them, without which those other ways won't exist. Yeah. So let's, let's move on then to how we pursue mission in our lives. How does that look? Well, like we do with community, I think the first thing we need to realize, and I kind of alluded to this just a second ago, but mission is never general. Right when when you walk on mission, you're not just kind of walking on mission like vaguely. You're you're walking on mission with people, right? Just like you're living and loving specific Christians, not just kind of Christians generally, but specific Christians, the one God puts in your life. When we're walking on mission, we're walking with specific non Christians, the, the people God has placed in our lives, and so and I think God has placed non Christians in each one of our lives at work, in our neighborhoods, maybe in your family, um, and. And I think it's helpful actually to to try to identify who those are, and so, and so mission isn't just this like general thing you're supposed to do. But I mean, I, if you're not you know driving or doing something else right now, I mean, I'd, I'd encourage you to stop and 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 write down the names of the non Christians in your life, like the the non Christians that you know you are called to love, that God's calling you to love, and to live on mission with, and and um, and, and even if you are driving and doing something else, I mean, maybe to to stop later on tonight. And do exactly that because I think that will help even the content of the next four sessions to not be about this kind of ethereal idea of what it's like to live on mission. But everything we'll be talking about then, we'll, we'll be talking about those people in your life. And you can be thinking about those specific people and, and how this applies to to them. Yeah, I think that's such a helpful a helpful tool to identify specific people and how you can put this into practice with specific people. Um, but I, I think when we think about as well, kind of the, the non-Christian relationships we have, it's easy for us to wonder what exactly are we supposed to be doing? What, it, what is it that, what does it look like to spread and display the glory of God in our relationships with non-Christians? And we know that we should be talking to them about the gospel. We know that we should be loving them in other ways, but it's hard to know how to handle really the specific moments of what makes up that relationship. And what I, I love about um, 2 Corinthians 5 is it gives us this overarching metaphor that really helps us understand what our role should be as Christians seeking to spread and display the glory of God in our relationships with non-Christians. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 to 21, say, that, uh, say this. Um, actually, I'm sorry, not 17 to 21. It's 14 through 21, skipping 16, 17, 18, and 19. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So we as Christians... Uh, 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 really uh, compelled by the love of Christ. Our whole life lived in response to that. And then he continues in verse 20, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Paul says we're ambassadors. We're ambassadors for Christ, that God is making his appeal through us, which is just such a powerful picture of our participation in God's plan. God could do whatever he wants. He could zap people and say, you're a Christian and you're a Christian and you're a Christian, right? He's sovereign over salvation. We believe that absolutely. But the way that he chooses to reach the world with his message of the gospel is by making his appeal through those who've been transformed by that same gospel. And that picture of an ambassador is a very compelling metaphor for us to understand what does it look like for us to be on mission and having relationships with non-Christians in our lives the way that God calls us to and wants us to. Uh, And Brian, uh, for example, taking this metaphor of an ambassador, what would be the difference between a tourist, for example, and an ambassador? We, I mean, we've gotten a, a lot of, I think, helpful uh, – there's, there's a lot of legs that, that, to that idea of tourist versus ambassador that we've used just in our ministry here in L.A., I think, for a long time now. Because we're in L.A., so we see a lot of tourists, maybe more than other places. Um, and so you, you, you tend to find that idea of a, you know, a tourist is a person who basically asks, how can I enjoy this place where I am for me? 
Mm. And, that, and that's not like that's necessarily bad. That's just what a tourist is by definition. Right. Like if you're somewhere as a tourist, that's kind of what you're doing. Um, and so all you know, everything's about consuming. What does this place have to offer me? And every decision is run through that grid. Like every decision is made based on trying to maximize consumption and enjoyment because you're only there for a week or two and so on and so forth. But then if you think about an ambassador, the, the, the fundamental question is really, really different. The question is, how can I relate to this place, you know, for my home country? And so that's interesting because it means that the ambassador is still going to like enjoy the food and, and enjoy the things that that place has to offer, but he's going to do so or she's going to do so with a larger purpose than just his or her own personal enjoyment. Mm. And so their decisions get run through a very different grid. And those end up being the questions that we have to ask ourselves when we read something like Second Corinthians 5, is, are we, is our decision-making grid about our life more that of a tourist in this place, where it's all run through the idea of what, how, how I can maximize my own enjoyment and kind of take from this place, or is it run through a higher grid, where of course I want to enjoy this place, but my decisions are about something uh, deeper and wider, I have a larger purpose here, which is to relate to this place for my God, and in that sense, my, 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 uh, my citizenship in heaven. And so, you know, that being said, like, I think that that is helpful in some ways, but we've also found that can be its own version of overwhelming. It's like, so, so what do I do? You know, how do I, how do I do this in all of these different relationships that I have and, and all these different ways that I'm, you know, living in this, this place called Los Angeles right now? Like, how do we think through this practically in a way that helps us take practical steps to having mission be an active part of our life? Absolutely. Good question. Um, so God has called us and sent us as ambassadors to engage our city. We just read that in 2 Corinthians 5, and uh, which is such a powerful image because it means we're not tourists, like Brian said. It also means this is not our home. Um, ultimately, this is where we're, we belong. Our citizenship, our allegiance, ultimately is somewhere else. Um, but it doesn't mean we're not engaged. It means we are engaged in a particular way with a particular purpose because we've been sent to represent someone um, from another place. And the best ambassadors really are those who love the people to whom they're sent. And if you're an ambassador sent to a country full of people that you really don't like, you're not going to be a good ambassador. Mm -hmm. To be an ambassador, to be a good ambassador, a good representative, you need to really deeply love the people who you are sent to. Um, and just like in the community section, we can use the same pathway uh, that we used there to visualize the practical ways that we can love others as we walk on mission. So it's the same love paradigm. You have this love paradigm that we used in community that we just completed the last four weeks. And we use that same paradigm to uh, uh, facilitate our relationships with non-Christians. Um, the application might look slightly different in some ways because uh, there's not the same brotherhood and sisterhood that is uh, is there with a, a Christian brother or sister, but it's the same principles that we're called to employ. So the love paradigm that we if you have in your notes uh, is the same, knowing, serving, speaking, and gospeling. And that's what it looks like practically to love um, non-Christians in our life. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> because I think there's a reality, right, where people are people, right? And so what loving is going to look like is going to look like getting to know them. Just like we've talked about, it's going to mean serving them, do, doing things for them, speaking, speaking truth to them, encouraging them, and, and even pointing out things that are, like, are inconsistent you know, that, uh, in their lives. And, 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 and like the biggest difference is in the category of gospeling, right? Like that's where instead of reminding them of gospel truth, uh, we're called to teach them and bring them to gospel truth that, that they don't know yet, mm -hmm. right? And introduce them to this incredible savior. So the rest of, of, our, uh, of, of our sessions in this section is basically going to be working through these elements of the paradigm uh, from the perspective of mission, as opposed to the last section where it was from the perspective of community. And so for the rest of this session, we'll talk about knowing from that perspective of mission. So Matt, can you walk us through the importance of this when it comes to being a good ambassador? How is knowing an important part of being an ambassador? It's crucial. Um, I mean, it's very, very crucial. Uh, we can't truly love someone unless we get to know them, who they are, their personality, their quirks, their hopes, their struggles, uh, and more. There's so much about who we are, the complexity of us as humans, that in order to truly love someone, we have to know them. Um, you can't have just uh, distant, um, positive feelings or vague, encouraging words 
they're, they're not what we're called to when it comes to biblical mission. Um, before we even know the right words to say, we sometimes get, we stumble over our relationships with non-Christians because we say, I don't know what to say. I'm not sure how to, to know what to say. And the reality is you can't really know what to say. You can't really know how to speak. You can't really know how to serve them. You can't really know how to share the gospel because we're not even taking the time to get to know the people that we're reaching out to. Um, and so the, the, the same kind of structure of knowing, uh, it, it, it takes the place, it takes in the place in the context of listening, asking, interpreting, and considering. Um, and that's really, really uh, fundamental to what it means to love and um, to uh, care for and to be on mission towards non-Christians in our lives. And, and before we even dive into that, before we dive into this listening, asking, interpreting, um, and considering, we need to spend some time thinking about what it looks like to get to know someone and how that affects our mission. And we see this in the New Testament uh, all over the place. We see Christians walking on mission in, in all kinds of relationships with their family, with acquaintances, with coworkers, uh, even strangers. There's there's this missional component, this um, being on mission that Christians are living out there, their walk with God um, as uh, ambassadors, uh, even with strangers. And no matter where our relationships are with non-Christians in our life, Love compels us to get to know them better. And so before we even jump into the, the elements of the paradigm, the elements of knowing, listening, um, asking, interpreting, and considering, uh, uh, we have to understand kind of the stages of development of relationships to better understand how we go deeper uh, with non-Christians in our lives. Yeah, the, these stages, I think, can be incredibly helpful because they allow you to see, sometimes as Christians, you meet another Christian in the church, and it feels like you can kind of jump several stages relationally because there's a sense of common ground um, that you have, and you're sort of at the same place for the same reason. But maybe you have coworkers or neighbors or you know any other sort of context you find uh, these people in, and we find ourselves after being Christians for a little while sometimes having a hard time remembering how to make friends, mm. and so it, it can be really helpful to understand yeah. these different stages. Because you kind of are able to realize, oh, like here's kind of where I'm where I'm at with this other person, and that helps me know how to get to know them better or how to progress. And, and the question of how do you get deeper with someone oftentimes has to start with the question of, well, how deep are we now? Like where you know where are we now? Yeah, yeah. And so if you think about it, and these these are in your notes, um, that, that at some point this is a pretty thorough little you know taxonomy of relationships because it starts with non-existent. So, so some people just don't know who they are. You have no idea they exist. Who? They, yeah, then, then there's uh, recognition. So you, you recognize the other person, the, the, someone you've seen before. Um, that guy who always wears jeans to work. That would be an example of you recognizing someone. Then you have this uh, stage that you tend to stay in. You can stay in for uh, quite a while, these next two. Acquaintance, where you've, you've been introduced to this person. You've had some small talk or sort of socialized in a relatively small group. Matt, would you mind? Oh, it's I met her once at a Christmas party. There you go. That's the that's the the tagline for that's acquaintance. Julie. Yes. <laughs> you might or might not know their name, but you Or you is know. it Christina? Then there's the conversational acquaintance where you've had multiple conversations with the other person, you know their name, um and you, your conversations have tended to focus around one particular thing that you find yourself doing together. That's like uh, Jim. Uh, he runs marathons, and we talk about it at work sometimes. Yeah, this is sort of your conversational acquaintance. Um, I like this. This is this feels smooth. Um, can, and then I do, you, can I do one, guys? <laughs> you can do the next one. Yeah, okay. do the next okay. one. Okay. Okay. Scott okay. can do okay. the deep okay. ones. Okay, okay, okay. So then there's, there's uh, f- f- a lot of people find themselves in that conversational acquaintance phase a long time because you don't have to ever ask outside of, the thing that you're both doing. So it's sort of like we're both, you know, the, the stereotypical at the water cooler at work or at the park with kids or, you know, all, all sorts of things. And that probably is where a lot of our relationships with non-Christians probably stop. Exactly. That, yeah, exactly right. And I think that's where um, the, the question, a lot of the questions then are, how do we uh, know someone better to, to get to a different kind of stage of relationship, which is friendship. So this is a person that you've had regular, intentional interactions with the other person, usually in different contexts about different things. Scott? Like Ben, who's my buddy from work, and we go out to dinner every once in a while. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Was that you might have hit Ben for? a little hard. Yeah. But yeah, that, I don't that think worked. I even know who this Ben is. <laughs> <laughs> and from there, you really have an opportunity to, to progress even deeper. For, we have People have friends, then they have what you could call consistent friends, 
where you have really regular, pretty intentional interactions that are also very personal. So you think here of your 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 circle of friends that you sort of a social circle that you're re- regularly interacting with, and then you have maybe an, a closer step, which is a close friend. This is the kind of person that you consider uh, to be one of your most intimate and enjoyable relationships. So these are the friends that you would say th- these are you know one of the few people I just tell everything to. You might have one, you might have several, and these stages then can help you kind of assess how close you are to the non-Christians in your life, and also kind of think about the ways to get to know them better. Yeah, and I think I mean I think these these different kind of categorization is is helpful, right? To for us to even think about like maybe how deep do I tend to go with yeah. my the non Christians in my life? Now, I, I mean, of course, it, it doesn't always look just like this, right? There's not like a normal pro- progress necessarily from stage to stage. You know, sometimes you jump stages, sometimes you you know get get really close to somebody for a while. So it's, sometimes you know it's appropriate that you kind of just stay at a certain. Um, place in a closeness with uh, different people for a long time, but but ultimately every because ultimately every re- un- relationship is unique, right? There, there's no formula, there's no kind of process you go th- go through. Um, but at the same time, and like I mentioned, I think it's helpful to think through m- maybe where you tend to stop, and and particularly with the non Christians in your in your relationship and or in in your life, and what it looks like to go deeper with maybe some of the specific people you've you've written on your list. Yeah, and I think there's I think there's uh I mean, you know, there's a lot of obstacles, right, that get in the way and and I, I think there's uh, a lot of hesitation on un, kind of uncertainty about how to help move deeper because part of this is if you're stuck in a certain place with non-Christians in your life, um oftentimes they're not the ones who are going to move it deeper. Uh, it's probably going to take an intentionality on your part mm. to deeply know them so that you can deeply love them mm-hmm. and build that relationship with them the way that God calls us to in his word, to be on mission, to deeply know and love who, uh, love them, um, who God has put in your life. And, and so there's a sense in which uh, I think uh, this first section of knowing where listening, asking, interpreting, and considering really help you move from one stage to the next. It requires a lot of listening. It requires a lot of asking of questions. It requires a lot of really deep engagement with who they are to build those relationships. And I would say non-Christians that I've met in the city of Los Angeles are very, very eager to have someone know them like this. And they don't very oftentimes don't have a lot of close people who are asking these questions and deeply wanting to know them. We live in a city where everyone kind of has an agenda. Everyone kind of has an angle. No one just wants to get to know people and love people. And we have a, a huge opportunity to move into deeper and deeper levels of these kinds of friendships with non-Christians in our life by knowing them well and loving them well that way. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And I think that that type of intentionality helps to overcome some of those those common obstacles, right? I mean, I think sometimes one of the biggest obstacles is just fear. Yeah. Like because we're going to be intentional, there's kind of this like fear of being rejected, right? Like fear, like well, that's not fun. Like you know, this, I, I want to try to be intentional with you, but maybe you don't want to be intentional, and and that's you know, we kind of have to face that. And so I think there's also sometimes a fear of being corrupted. I think there's a fear mm-hmm. of being rejected. There's also like a fear of being corrupted. I think this is what cr- keeps Christians kind of mm-hmm. in their bubbles a lot. We're like, well, what I you know, I can't hang out with these people because, like, I don't know. And for Ank, for a new Christian, there might be some wisdom in that, sure. right? Like, sometimes you do need to create some space as a young Christian who's, you know, maybe struggling in certain ways. to you not just come just, out like, of a lifestyle yeah. of that. Yeah, to, like, dive back, right back into those friendships and lifestyles. I think you need to be careful of that. But especially for um, more mature Christians, like, the fear of being corrupted is something I think God calls us to, to overcome, not so we can indulge in the, the lifestyle and kind of relive that, but to overcome out of love. Hmm. Um, and, and I think, I mean, I think another one of the obstacles is, is time. I mean, we, sometimes we can't be intentional with people because we don't intentionally create the space to do so in our lives. I know this is something that, that Laura and I've been talking a lot about, even just over the last year. Like, what does it look like? Like, we've tried to be intentional with the non-Christians in our lives, but things can crowd that out and it, it requires creating space mm-hmm. uh, for the purpose of mission. Um, and it doesn't just happen. That, no, it's, it, it's not just going to happen. It's probably, uh, I mean, even of the all the things, the other parts of the discipleship pathway, I mean, at least I, for me, I think for a lot of us as Christians, it might be the, the least 
natural in that sense. They're the least automatic to happen if you're going to church every week and, you know, anchors in, in, in around Christians a lot and things like that. Um, and I mean, I think a, a, the last obstacle that we can face is just tension. Like just the fact that it, sometimes it's hard because these are fallen people, right? Just like we're fallen people and people, there's all sorts of things people have to put up with us that there's, there's things that are difficult and not enjoyable about relationships um, with people who don't have any concept of God or aren't trying to please him. And, um, and I think part of love means even being patient and bearing, bearing through that tension so that we can, can love them well. Yeah, Matt's talked about uh, friendships and relationships uh, in terms of a junior high dance before where it's sort of like so someone needs to take, you know, there's people on the opposite side of the wall. Someone needs to take a step. <laughs> and in any relationship, there's a sort of dance where, you know, everyone's waiting for the other person to, to, to take a first step. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what's nice about going through these stages is you realize that this isn't uh, an imposition on other people. We're not we're not like selling something. Love allows us to be the people that can take a first step, you know, and I think that's that's what we're talking about doing. And in a lot of ways, that's how we're moving forward when we talk about these uh, the things like listening, uh, asking, interpreting, considering. So let's let's walk through those four things from a mission perspective. What do we need to talk about when it comes to listening? Yeah, I, I think this is so helpful for me because uh, sometimes there's a fear of engaging with non Christians in our lives, and we we stop short because we're afraid of. Uh, saying the wrong thing right away. And I would argue that the first thing we should do is probably not say a ton, um, but probably just listen a lot. Um, Get to know them by hearing them. Get to know them by hearing their story, who they are, what what matters to them in their life. Um, uh, Proverbs 18 says, An intelligent heart acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. There's this kind of desire to know somebody, um, to know who they are, to know... Uh, um, uh, really more about where they come from and what um, uh, what kind of person, like what, what matters in their life. Um, and, and I think there's something really compelling about listening as a category of knowing that this idea of good listening means this paying attention and focusing and, and really caring about what they're saying that I think is radical and mm. absolutely unusual in our, in our context. Mm. Um, people don't, so many times everyone's just eager to waiting to speak rather than actually just listening and being a listening ear to a, a non-Christian in your life. Um, you might be the only one in their life who is is doing that and is willing to do that. And that's such a powerful and loving way to get to know somebody. Hey, I think that's such a, a, a great point. And I, that's been my experience. I, mean, I know with the, <clears throat> the non-Christians in my life, the the vast majority of them like, aren't used to people just listening to them and, 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 and listening to them to actually get to know them. We pay uh, people to yeah, listen to us, yeah, right? Like yeah, it's yeah, not, yeah. the, the yeah. idea of friendship is not yeah. about that. And I think as we strive to be better listeners to the non-Christians around us, I think that it begins, like that's where it begins. It begins with actually caring. Mm. It, it begins with genuinely loving them and wanting to know about their opinions and their lives. Not, not so you can ref- refute them, Right, not so that you can like know how to argue with them, but just so that you can know them as a person, and, and that's where I mean I think w- when we think of the non Christians in our lives as, as projects, like that's where anybody anybody that you kind of in your mind think of as a project, like they sense that, of course, like you feel that out, like it doesn't take that long, and and and, and that's like that's gross to people, like nobody wants that, and God doesn't call us to do that. God doesn't call us to make. He's not saying live on mission, make non-Christians your projects. He's, he, he, God has so loved us and pursued us. He's calling us just to love them, mm. to genuinely care and to, 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 to find out what they care about. What, is it the environment? Is it sports? Is it music? Is it like what, what of their, and, and, and even as you do so, to identify like what of their values reflect their identity as an image bearer? Right? There are things that they value. There's things that they, there's beauty that they find in this world that reflect their, the reality that they are image bearers of God. And, and, and there are also going to be components that they're missing. They're, they're, they're missing a, a comprehension of a full picture of, of the beauty and magnificence of, of the world that, that we're in. But we, we're not going to know that if we just try to 
kind of listen long enough to argue with them, listen long enough to respond, and instead get to know and learn them. And I think that's really powerful too. It's something to consider is uh, if somebody, if a non-Christian in your life is sharing something with you that you disagree with, you don't have to openly disagree with them. At the That doesn't have to like be the first thing. If they say something like, oh, I just, you know, true happiness just comes from making a lot of money. Like you don't have to automatically first first thing out. Oh, this is my first conversation yeah. with um, Bill, my neighbor. Bill, that's wrong, right? Money's not going to give you happiness. I just heard a sermon on that last week. You're wrong, Bill. What's wrong with you? Yeah. Only God can give you happiness. Life's not Facebook. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, exactly. And there's a sense of there's a sense of patience with a lot of these things that says, I'm going to listen first and we'll have time for conversations later once we build close relationships with people. Um, I'm not saying never speak uh, to them. We'll get no, there. We're, we're get that, um, yeah. but, but I'm talking about knowing them and, 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 uh, and listening carefully. What about asking? What, what kind of questions are we talking about when we get to that second aspect? Yeah, I think, I think there's a diagram in your notes as well, the heart diagram that we've referenced before where, where you have at, at the core of your heart, you have worship, and then there's springing out of that, there's motives and, and values and desires, and, and that produces thoughts and behaviors and emotions, and there's circumstances that um, play into that. So having kind of a, a sense of that in your head as you engage with uh, the non-Christians in your life and asking questions about those elements of who they are. Um, you know, uh, the ones that are most obvious are circumstance ones or, you know, like asking questions about, uh, you know, where they work or where they grew up or where they went to college or where they went to high school or whatever it is, you know, like what kind of sports teams they like. Uh, if, uh, there's a new track that was just released that they really like to listen to a song, (laughs) that was a reference (laughs) to the last one. Um, uh, the, the, there's Beyonce. Beyonce. <laughs> um, oh boy! But asking questions about those circumstances is totally appropriate and okay. But then also going deeper and asking about uh, how they live and and how they feel about certain things and what they think about certain things. And then he, you know, being willing to go deeper and asking about like what their values are, like what like what is really important to them in life. Um, that's something that uh, I think is really important, and I think. People are eager to share about. Mm. You don't have to force um, the vast majority of the time, unless you're like really abrupt with your questioning, like what is the most important thing in your life? Like that's not <laughs> helpful. But like um, to, maybe they feel really compelled about the environment, right? Mm. Like talk to me about that. Tell me more about um, your love for the environment. Where does that come from? Like yeah. how, what's so compelling about that for you? I want to hear about that. And people are typically really eager to share about um, about why certain things are really important to them. So asking about those values questions can be a really helpful, powerful way to get to know someone deeply. Man, I think that's such a great point. And it, it actually brings up a, a fascinating tension that I was thinking about as I was thinking about this topic. I, I think I feel like uh, I need to be a little bit less intense in my question asking with non-Christians. I mean, like I, I tend to ask a lot of questions right. with people, particularly with like the Christians in my life. And we kind of like, you know, dig in and we, and, and oftentimes when I'm hanging out with my non-Christian friends, I'm like, oh, you know what? Okay. Maybe I should back off. Like maybe I shouldn't like just follow my instinct to like ask those questions. And what's interesting is I, I've almost always found that, that like pullback actually pretty unneeded. Um, because I find that same thing that people like, I mean, first of all, everybody loves to talk about themselves. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, that's, that's, you know, even the most shy people in the world, like oftentimes like, that's, that's, that's a topic that like, open up. It. But, but even more than that, I think people love to engage in real ways, in, in deep ways. And, and, and they want like, I mean, just as, as image bearers, like we want to know, we want to be known more than just like the label or the headline version of like what we think, like we, because the way all of us think as humans is, is nuanced and is complicated and comes from all sorts of different places and, and all sorts of like different things we believe and think are, are deeply rooted and, and asking people uh, about those to, to explain them and to, to get to know them and following kind of following the trail of their, um, of how they respond or, or how they think, or even following the trail of their emotions, um, it is a place that, I mean, it's not always, you know, in every situation appropriate. And, and actually, I, I think that as men, we might get like a bad rap about this. Mm-hmm. That like, yeah, no, 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 that's not something we can do. Um, like guys go, don't guys, go deep. Yeah, guys don't go deep. Like just, you know, just kind of sit there and, 
you know, hang out or just do an activity together. And, and I mean, I, on the surface level, maybe in some of those like kind of initial uh, relationships we talked about, like that, that might be the case. But with the guys I know, with the even with the non-Christian guys I know, like that's like it, even if on the surface they're like, yeah, I just you know, just kind of want to do something. Like you start asking them, like they want to talk, absolutely, and and they want to talk about real things. And uh, I, I think that's a that's an opportunity both for for men and women. I mean, kind of regardless of your age, I think it's uh, questions can just. Uh, swing open those doors. Absolutely, and the, they're powerful displays of love, and you show someone you have genuine interest when you ask really good questions that are really uh, built to to get to know those people. I mean, there's people, there's non-Christians in my life who've described me as like a really close friend that I felt like I didn't know them very well at all. But from their perspective, they might not have a lot of people who are asking them close questions or, or wanting to know them at that level. And so my interest in them at that level was really powerful for them to say, wow, this person really cares about me and really wants to know me. So then what about interpreting? We've been through listening, asking. Let's talk about interpreting. Yeah, uh, interpreting is really important because uh, when you're listening to someone, when you ask questions and they're sharing things about themselves, you're never just hearing facts. There's always something um, uh, really underneath the words that they're saying. They're, they're speaking from their own perspective on their circumstances and emotions, thoughts, behaviors, and and, and so on. Um, and so love means really deeply thinking through what they're saying and interpreting it W- uh, with grace and understanding to try to really understand where this person is coming from. Um, it's it's a, a crucial step to really get to know someone as well as you possibly can to try to hear really the heart underneath what their words are saying. Um, and I think that's a really powerful way to, to love and care for non-Christians because it's easy to just dissect people's words and say, oh, they obviously, they said this or this or this or this. But if you listen really carefully, you can hear um, the emotion and the tone underneath uh, a lot of what people are saying. And not only that, you can hear um, and try to understand from their perspective. Maybe this is helpful to think of like walking in their shoes a little bit mm-hmm. to say, let me try to understand where they're coming from, from their perspective, what, why this is such a big deal. This, you know, I think about some non-Christians in my life, things that are big deals to them would not be big deals to me. Mm-hmm. And it'd be easy for me to just mm-hmm. write them off as, immature or whatever it is, you know, you could call it whatever you want, but that would be foolish of me. I should put myself in their shoes and say, why is this so important to them? Oh, I realize why it's so important because they explained this is, was an important thing to, I don't know, whatever, to their dad or something. And yeah. so that's an important thing to them and you understand them a little bit better. Yeah. And I think it's, it's an important like first step, right. To interpreting these things like, like holistically and biblically, because we, everyone has an interpretation of why they think what they think or why they do what they do or why they feel what they feel. I mean, they're, they're, they're usually using some form of like interpretive grid. Like maybe it's a maybe it's a spiritual grid, like having to do with energies or the universe. I mean, a lot of people like interpret things that way. And that's they kind of read things through that grid. And um, for some people, it's a, it's a personality grid, right? Like this is just the way I am and I'm kind of this way. And so that's, that's why this is the case. I mean, I think probably uh, most commonly I run into people who just read the interpretation of the whys between behind things as a mental health grid. Mm. They kind of use like just there's like mental health terminology and mental health concepts to define their motives Mm. and then to define kind of the, the, the causes behind what they experience, Mm. right? It's, it's all kind of in this, in this realm of mental health, at least kind of right now at the moment we're in. Um, But but our job as Christians is to do more than just understand their interpretation, right? But to also then take that and interpret what we're hearing in light of a biblical worldview. And I think if we're going to speak winsomely, if we're going to speak lovingly, if we're going to direct them and actually be able to share the gospel with them, um, then we can't just take their interpretation, but we, we need to... Um, First, before we speak, before we say anything, before we do anything, we, we need to ask, okay, h- how does scripture understand what you're experiencing? Right? And not so that we can argue, not so we can like throw things back in your face, but so that we can, I mean, I mean, if you think about the non-Christians in your life and the conversations you have with them and the things that they explain to you, if we have scripture and the spirit of God dwelling in us, that means God has granted us the opportunity and really the privilege of understanding them even better than they do. Like we have an opportunity, like we understand 
what's going on in their hearts, even just especially as we get to know them more accurately before God than than they do themselves. And that we should consider that a stewardship, mm. like not just something that we like use to kind of prove them wrong or like to you Bo- know boast win arguments. Yeah. No, no, no. But like a, a stewardship that God has given to us is to to um, to use these opportunities to point them to the interpretations, you know, as we're going to talk about how we do speaking and and things like that, but point them to the interpretations that make even more sense of what they're experiencing and that they're rooted in, in truth and the God of the gospel, the God of creation and how he has created us and how he's created us to work. So finally we have considering and let's talk for a little bit about how that fits into the rest of these. Yeah, I think considering relates closely to interpreting. They're they're kind of a certain kind of thinking that we do that is an aspect, a really crucial aspect of loving um, non Christians in our lives and getting to know them really well. Uh, and so you have to really consider what is needed at the most at, at mo- the needed the most. Excuse me, at, in that moment. So when someone's sharing something about who they are or something about what what uh, matters most to them, or you're asking questions and you're listening and hearing them, and you're kind of interpreting it through this biblical lens that says, okay, so um, you know, we we might use the term worship uh, to describe what uh, this person describe is is talking about the way they're talking about their work, the kind of identity and meaning and significance they get from their work, from a biblical biblical grid. That's clearly like a worship thing that like gives them meaning and identity and purpose. So considering is that next step that says, so how can I love them best in this moment? How can I love them in this conversation? What is the most loving thing I can do? How do I, how do I, uh, um, how do I love them? And it's not just share the gospel, right? Like it's not just like um, say, well, Jesus died for you. And so you should believe in him. Like that, that's where, that's where a lot of our conf- confusion comes in about the uh, uh, evangelism. And it doesn't mean that we don't say that. No, it doesn't mean but that you some, don't say sometimes that. Sometimes it is that. Sometimes it absolutely is. But there's a, uh, a kind of thoughtfulness that says, yeah. where are they and, and how do I love them best exactly. in my engagement and my interaction with them? Yeah, exactly. um, that, that is the step of considering. So let's talk a little more about that. Like, let's say, for example, you have a friend whose child is acting out a lot at school. You know, just a a friend or an acquaintance of yours that you talk to regularly. And they're they're just saying, yeah, my, you know, my kid is acting out a ton at school. It's causing problems at home and we're not really sure what to do. You know, that's that's what they're saying. Like, what does considering look like in a situation like that? If it's not, well, he should believe in Jesus, you know, and and that'll, that'll fix it. You know, like, what, 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 how do you consider on a, on a more nuanced, robust level than, than that? I mean, as you consider this, I mean, that's obviously, I mean, these hypotheticals, like, there's all sorts of things you, places you could start. But I think it, it begins by starting with, like, uh, just ex- communicating a compassionate heart, right? That, that you recognize how difficult that is mm. and that, that you probably know what that's like. Like, you know, and, and, and that you recognize the, the, the emotions and the experience kind of wrapped up in that, right? The, the embarrassment. And like the weird kind of shame and the frustration and the powerlessness, um, and and then kind of from there, like and resonating with him, like you, you might, um, I mean, you might begin. I mean, one kind of entry level thing you could do is just offer to pray for them, right? Um, and and as and pray for pray for their child. You you might you know um, invite them over to like spend some time together. Um, and and you might be able to go deeper. There might be some some truths about, and you know there there might be a parenting conference at church or, or even a book, right, that you can hand them. But it, in all of this, you're going to take that moment to consider kind of like, what's most needed and where's this relationship at, right? Like, I, I'm not going to throw a book at like a like new uh, person you just met. Exactly. Exactly. You know, um, but how have I earned that opportunity? And, and, and is that something that in that sense, like they're asking from me? Hmm. It's interesting that sometimes you might find yourself, the thing that's most needed as you consider is something that's not even related to what the specifics of fixing whatever they had just mentioned. You know, it's maybe it's yeah. just having them over for dinner. Yeah. I mean, that's what's most needed. It's, you yeah, know, it's yeah. not just like support. A, yeah. yeah. It, it's interesting to see how broad this considering can take us. So yeah. let, let's use a different example. Let's say someone who maybe is having trouble finding a job. You know, is it, is it the same? Is it different? Are we, you know, what are the patterns of considering that we're going to kind of notice as we go through different examples? Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's, there's some similarities, right? Like, uh, uh, the difficulty and the frustration and 
the struggle of finding a job can be a really painful one. Um, it can be really, really difficult for someone who's in that position struggling and, and being just a listening ear to, to, uh, to hear how they're dealing with that, how they're uh, feeling about that, what, and, and empathizing with them about their experiences and saying, uh, acknowledging those things and saying, yeah, that is I'm so hard. It's so hard. What a, what a difficult, a difficult place to be in, in uh, being there for them and being present with them. And then taking that next step to say, um, what is it? How can I help? How can I help this person? Yeah. What, what are, what are ways, maybe practical ways I can help them? Um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe they have a resume that you can share, right? Like, or, or other things like that, that you can help say, I'm, I'm, I want to help you with this felt need. Um, but then also uh, ask them about their worry. How is that worry impacting their life? Are there, um, struggles they're having? Is that causing them to, I don't know, drink more? Is it causing them to, uh, um, fall into some sort of, uh, state of, uh, lethargy, right? Like where they're yeah. just giving up and stuff like that. And, um, talking to them about the, the significance and the beauty of, 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 of life. So I, I don't, there's yeah. a variety of ways. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of those things, whether it's, you know, just whether it's deeper truth or whether it's just practical help, like, you know, just help with a resume, I think both manifest love and they, they're, they're going to change depending on, uh, the, depending on the, the moment and kind of what's most needed at the particular moment. And it's going to change, like we said, to, depending on the relationship. Let me give you one more, a different one, okay. where the, uh, y- your, your friend is, explains to you the opposite of that. They just got a big promotion and kind of a massive raise, and they're pretty excited, just like, hey, I had a, had a really good week last week. Mm. What, what, what do you, how does considering look when it's not a negative crisis, when it's something good that happens? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I, actually, it's a great question and a challenging one. I'm like, hmm. Like, <laughs> I don't know, Brian. I, but but yeah. but but I, but I think but I think that, I mean what one of the amazing things is that number one, like we can celebrate with them, right? We can we're both there in the pain and we're there in the joy, and we can we can celebrate with them. And I think both the, the but I think both the negative and the positive provide opportunities to insert and 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 to look for opportunities to insert the the hope of the gospel, um, right? Because th- there's there might be a lot of um, there might be a lot of celebration there. Um, there are also like maybe some discouragement that like, wait, why am I still anxious? Hmm. Right? Why am I still worried about things? Like, why am I still, or, you know, and, and, and I think, so I, I think it, it all kind of depends on where they're at, but, um, as you consider what's most needed, I mean, what's most needed in that moment, just as a friend might very well be like taking them out to dinner to celebrate. And maybe that's like, that's that chapter. Yeah, I think there that's a, a really helpful a helpful uh, response. I think there's there's ways also that we can be you know cautious about uh, uh, maybe even c- celebrating um, things that they you know uh, maybe shouldn't be celebrating. Like there's ways that they uh, they might say now I can now I can buy whatever I want I can do whatever I want and you don't have to like affirm that in a relationship yeah. you don't have to like considering also means being wise and not saying oh yeah money's great you can do whatever you want now and you don't have to worry about anything ever again just kind of saying wow that's so awesome I'm so happy that you've been successful but um, but also understanding that you I mean I, I think Scott's example of of the anxiety and worry still being there that might be the getting of a job and getting a promotion might be a high for a moment. And then in two weeks, part of the considering is saying in two weeks, I have a feeling he's going to be uh, upset about things again and worried about things again. Mm-hmm. And this might, when this, when this high wears off, I want to be there for him to, to make sure that, um, to make sure that uh, he knows I love him and, and support him and can help him think yeah. through those things when that time comes. Yeah. And, and I mean, and, and just to clarify too, like it's, it, as we consider what's most needed, like this isn't to downplay the fact that ultimately we know what's most needed is like for them to know Christ, right? That is their ultimate hope. And so we, if we love them well, and we're going to talk about this right in the coming sessions, but if we love them well, we're, we're going to be considering when we can share that as well. Um, when we can uh, provide opportunities and open doors to to explain that and and, and to offer them just the the greatest hope in this entire world, um, but I, I think part of what we're trying to paint is a, is a relationship that's not that d- doesn't solely exist. It's not simply biding its time 
until I can like get that in. Right. But it's considering how to love others in all of these various different ways. And I think that's really helpful. The, a lot of the considering that it, you are going to be doing in these relationships are going to be the things that we're going to talk about over the next three weeks. Yeah. I should consider is now the time to serve them in some practical way. Um, is now the time to ask them if I can pray with them is now the time to, um, you know, bear with them is, is, is now the time to speak about something and encourage them is now the time to gospel and really, uh, uh, you know, is now the time that, that God has, um, given me in the relationships at a, a place where I'm, I can share the gospel with them and they'd be receptive to that. Like those are, what you're considering the next th- three weeks that we're, we're talking about. And so you get this picture of knowing the non-Christians in our life as an act of love. You get this, just this beautiful picture of, uh, of listening and, and being an ear for them, of asking questions and seeking to get to know them, of interpreting and listening carefully to their answers and filtering it through this biblical grid, and then considering how do I respond in love in this situation to help them, um, help this person uh, um, um, come to know Christ. And I think it's a powerful picture. Yeah, and I, mean, I think to go back to um, just where you started at the beginning, I think that a lot of us as Christians, sometimes in our non-Christian relationships, we think, man, I... I don't know where to start. Like, I don't know what to say. I don't, you know, we, we, it doesn't seem like we really have anything in common. So like, what do I do? Um, I think knowing them, taking the time to truly know them, like we've been talking about, I mean, to kind of reiterate the point um, is where we start. And when you do, when you know them, uh, you'll, you'll know what to say. Yeah. You'll, you'll know what to do and, and you'll know how to love them well. All right. So we're talking about walking in the world, spreading and displaying God's glory in our lives. And we've just begun in this new section to talk about walking on mission as a part of that and seeking to love others by knowing them. And here's what we talked about. We talked about how mission is part of spreading God's glory. We talked about how, uh, how, how uh, we gave you an overview of what mission looks like, of how to uh, pursue this mission in this paradigm. Uh, and then we talked about how we can pursue mission by knowing other people well. And so here are some practical questions for you leaving this session. First... In what areas of your engagement or lifestyle in L.A. are you more of a tourist than an ambassador? And what does it look like to be more of an ambassador in your approach to the city in which you live? And second, what non-Christians in your life could you spend more time listening to this week? 